I want to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar and it's actually the first in a series that we are planning and um, I'm really excited um, to have Dave McComb, the CEO of um, Semantic Arts um, with us today. Um, we've been talking forth and back and seeing each other for quite a while. I've been reading his books and you know I'm now I'm also a data centricity evangelist. I've as I just noticed here on the starting slide. So very, very exciting to have you here, Dave. Thank you for coming. Um, you, in your book, um, The Software Wasteland, you have uh, been claiming that IT costs are skyrocketing due to the best practices that we see in IT today. And I think this is worthwhile talking about uh, because it's, you know, it's a big problem that you're pointing out. And I, I think um, the audience that we have will be very interested to learn um, a little bit about why you say this, because I think it's you're making some bold claims. I'm all excited about it, and I'd like to you know share this with the audience. Um, in this little webcast, um, the audience will be muted. So if you have questions, please um, put those into the chat, and we'll have um, colleagues of mine kind of sift through them and try to you know, make those available to Dave um, during the course of the presentation or rather at the end of the presentation. Um, but uh, let me just go on into this for now. And obviously none of those company presentations go without introducing uh, the host. And um, we are a sensor. We are, I guess, essentially data centric. Um, we, our focus is on building semantic data fabrics in organization driving automation with knowledge. Um, and we do this with knowledge graph technology, of course. And um, yeah, we are a European company centered in Leipzig, Germany, and you know, kind of spread out a bit around Europe. Um, our key customers are enterprise customers, um, but an interesting trend that we are seeing is really that smaller size companies, which is like 500 million to 5 billion revenue, are actually starting to embrace knowledge graph technology very exciting for us because previously this was really only for the big boys and their research departments. Now we're seeing this trickle down to medium-sized companies, um, which means this is becoming more of a broader topic overall. And I think this is a global trend, very exciting. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's what we do. We help these organizations on their journey to data centricity. Um, but let me move on to introduce Dave. Um, Dave is the president of Semantic Arts, a consulting firm he co-founded in 2000. For 20 years, Semantic Arts has been a specializing in semantics and knowledge graphs for enterprise applications. And for the last five years, they've been specializing further in enabling data centricity, writing these exciting books. And um, I'm really happy and would like to welcome Dave. And um, Dave, just uh, let me start out with the question that everybody uh, who is attending today is obviously wondering about uh, why do you think IT cost is exploding at the at the rate that we've that we've been talking about uh, in the for, uh, few last few months. Right. Thanks, Chris. Um, well, I guess the the first question is not everyone believes that it's exploding. You know, in fact, there's a whole bunch of people who think it's not growing fast enough. If you're in the systems integration business, if you're in the application software business. If you're even an enterprise application developer, you may not think it's growing fast enough, <clears throat> but actually it is. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. And, and so my evidence ranges from the anecdotal and the very specific to the, to the statistical and the more general, but God, probably one of my favorite anecdotes, we were rafting in the Grand Canyon, which by the way is a beautiful trip. You know, it's a five day trip. There's a guy in the raft who worked for a medium-sized systems integration firm, and they were working on an $800 million implementation project of Salesforce for an electric utility in California. And I went, wait a minute, how, what could you, how, how many bodies do you have to have to spend $800 million on a, on a SaaS-based program for a utility company? who are not actually all that well known for their customer service anyway. And if you make it that much better, big deal. But, um, and their worry was they'd never done an $800 million implementation. So they're probably going to lose out to the big boys. Uh, and yet in that whole conversation, 
it didn't even occur to him that maybe this was an $8 million project or an $800,000 project, <laughs> some, <clears throat> some number that, that, that makes some sort of sense. And we see this every place we go. People have just, have just decided that it's, that it's normal and okay for, for systems to cost hundreds of millions of dollars and take years. And so, and, and they believe that because it does. You know, I, I suppose it's a self-reinforcing belief. After, after you, you know, you go to conferences and talk to your fellow CIOs. And, oh my God, we got through that SAP implementation. It's worse than running a marathon, you know, <clears throat> but at least we got through and, and you know, marginal value. And, and so you have to ask yourself, what is, are, are the people that are driving up all these costs, are they, are they crooks or are they idiots, you know? one or the other. And, and frankly, I know a lot of them. I don't actually think they're either. I think they have developed these best practices. You know, you want to be safe and make sure the project's not going to crash and burn and it will actually get done. And so they have, you know, they have three streams, you know, they're, it's comical. There's, there's always a data stream, a people stream and a software stream. And each one of them falls into its own self perpetuating trap. I, especially like the data stream one, because inevitably the team shows up and they start getting ready to convert to the new system and they start taking the data out of wherever it is and putting it somewhere else. And they go, oh my God, we have a data quality problem. We have to start a data quality project. And now we can't even go forward until we fix the quality of this horrible data. <clears throat> and the truth is, you know, yes, the data almost always could be better. But the literal truth is, the data adhered to some set of rules in the old system. It was good enough for whatever the old system did, but the new system has a different set of rules. They're arbitrarily different. You're gonna hear me use the word arbitrary over and over again, because everything about information systems is it, almost everything is arbitrary. So there's an arbitrary new set of rules. And now the data has to conform to that. Of course, that's a problem. And of course you're trying to do it while you're converting. <clears throat> Meanwhile, you got the software itself and ages ago, there were all these studies that, that if you introduce a change late in the software life cycle, it's going to cost you 40 times as much as if it does up front. You know, there were all kinds of, because, and, and it's because it's sort of like moving a bearing wall in your house after you built it. It's dead easy to do when, you're, when it's still on the drawing board. You know, that costs you a few dollars. But once the house is built or the building's built, you move the wall. That's a, that's a big deal. And and software, unfortunately, isn't all that soft. It's, it's pretty hard when you go to move something late in the game. And what happens on that software track of an implementation project is there's already millions, sometimes tens of millions of lines of code. And you wake up one morning in the project, for the first part of the project is let's get all the requirements. You know, it's one of the, <clears throat> one of the seven sins we have later in the, in the deck. Let's get all our requirements up front to make sure that we don't miss anything till the very end. And then people go in and start trying to customize this incredible mass of millions of lines of code. It's real hard. I mean, I've done it before. I've lived through this. It's hard work because everything's connected to everything. And anytime you change something, regression tests and what did you break? And you know, that's one of the things here, dependency and complexity, you know, 10 million lines of code is complex, no matter how well written it is, you know, nobody can comprehend it. That's a lot going on. <clears throat> so you've got this middle tier that's, that's constantly trying to make changes at somewhere between 20 and 40, you know, uh, 120th or 140th or productivity that, that could be possible. <clears throat> and then finally you've got on the people track, you know, this is the one that drives me nuts. Then the team shows up and says, well, we're going to have to implement best practices. And really best practice is just a euphemism for do it the way the software project product does it. They're not necessarily any better than probably what you were doing before. Maybe you can knock a few days out of accounts receivable. Maybe you can get a few more turns on your inventory. Great. Uh, but, the, but the literal truth is, absolutely everything about the workflow is going to change. The, the sequence of tasks is going to change. The names of the screens change. The names of the fields change. All the uh, 
taxonomies, the, the categories, everything changes kind of arbitrarily. And the people that have been using the old system ha now had to be retrained. They, in fact, they only know their domain through the system. All the terms that were used in the system, all that kind of stuff, that's their whole world. They've learned that. They've been using this system for decades. So actually, and actually, uh, by trying to implement standard software, you're basically pouring that complexity of standardization onto a process that was simple, right? I mean, if you're talking right. about Salesforce, mm -hmm. I mean, very simple process, very easy to understand business objects. You know, if you're talking utility, even very easy to understand products, not too many, right? And not too complicated, definitely not a big bill, a bill of material, right? right? So very easy, very simple, but now you're trying to uh, replicate the simple thing in a complex standard piece of software, right? And, and all of a sudden you're pouring the complexity of standard software on your simple process and all of that makes your simple process, you know, exponentially more complicated. Multiply that by the number of different systems that you're using. And all of a sudden you've got that quagmire that you talk about, right? Exactly, exactly. And so I suppose I was, thank, thank you for cutting me off. I was, I was just no, making- sorry. <laughs> No, it's great actually. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but but I was mostly making the point, not so much why is it exploding, but just that it is exploding. I mean, mm -hmm. right. every place I look that 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 the cost of hardware and software and communications and everything has dropped a million fold. But, you know, when I put in my first payroll system, you know, it was tens of person years to build it custom. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, and I've looked at payroll systems a lot. Nowadays, they're about 10% more complex than they used to be. I talked to somebody at a conference once, he tells me, oh no, they're much more complex. No, actually, they, we used to build them in the 70s and they, even back then they had complex deductions and garnishment and t tax tables and all that crap. It's, it's, it hasn't changed that much, but try and implement a payroll system in a large enterprise these days. You know, it's not one millionth of a million dollars, it's many million. So anyway. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you're talking about that. And then of course, when you talk about the complexity of these systems, obviously they have, you know, since they try to multi-purpose, you know, this application to a hundred different clients, they have this super uh, complicated data model, right. Yep. And a built in rigidity or resilience to change basically, right. Because you have that model and it is very, very hard to adapt the model to the need of the client, basically, because of the conceptual uh, paradigm that this whole software is built on. I think that's why the, you know, that's the root cause of this all, this whole thing, right? right? Yeah. Um, the complexity that comes from a, a model that is built around rigidity, rather than on a focus on, on you know, conceptual and flexibility, um, because I guess that's what digital transformation is screaming for, right? Uh, mm -hmm. change uh, but the only thing that software was not built for is change right 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 and then and, you know as you point out an individual system is incredibly more complex than it needs to be but the okay. system of systems you know any large enterprise has hundreds or typically thousands of these and they multiply because they all have overlapping data models but they didn't design them to be overlapping you know the the CRM system has customers and so does the order taking system. And so does the MRO system, and, you know, so does, then they all do. And they have inter interfaces and systems integration and all this stuff to just ship the stuff around. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's also, I guess it's also a bit of a competing business, uh, you know, com the, the, the objective of the customer competes with the objective of the software vendor, right? Because Absolutely. every vendor wants to be the owner of a certain set of data because that means he's irreplaceable. So every uh, little, you know, every piece of software tries to grab more land in the organization. And obviously this means we have competing land grabs going on, which is constantly causing conflicts and, and obviously co exponential uh, problems for IT. Right. And so, so we really need to get away. And I think this is where, you know, where your mindset came in with that uh, being application centric versus being data centric, right? Um, you know, go, get away from land grab of applications, basically that are battling it out for owning a share of your wallet to, well, why don't you own your own data, become data centric and then provide the data to those, you know, um, uh, 
um, roaming troops, troopers, you know, that are application vendors, right? And let them have the data, you know, on your terms rather than you using the data on their terms, right? Exactly. I think that's kind of the the thing. And I, I, you know, talking a, bit, a little bit, so, you know, we had this, we coined this phrase data darkness, right? Because really we're, you know, this is a data, you know, we, when we, the, the dark ages, the middle ages, you know, we had, um, you know, a, a warlord basically in every valley. So when you walk through the valley from one side to the other, you know, this guy, you know, is going to text you basically um, mm -hmm. on the way through and on the way back again. And we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of those, you know, just in a small country like Germany, right? Nothing working. Well, and those warlords are now the application vendors, right? Because they put a tax on you taking data out of the system uh, or a tax of you putting data into the system. And, you know, with HANA, they're actually charging also you to actually look at your own data. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit like those warlords. So that's where moving back in the dark ages, you know, and, and I think your data centricity movement that, they've, that you've, um, you know, started basically is really saying, okay, why don't we get over this, you know, and not be taxed, you know, by the applications for getting access to our data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then really decoupling from that complexity uh, you know, cutting loose from those interface wars, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Cutting loose from redundancy and the dependency. I think that's kind of the thing. And I, it really resonated very well with me because it's exactly what we see in every large organization that we get into. Obviously, everybody makes a living on, you know, basically, and I see that people, you know, software people love to be in 10 year projects because it kind of tells them, okay, I'm not going to get fired for the next 10 years. Um, it's this is really strategically the best thing for the organization is still questionable but you know i think uh, for everyone who doesn't have his hand on your book yet um you know in the first one third of the book maybe even first half of the book you know all the evidence is there um that that we are in a terrible place right now right but mm -hmm. there's you're also hinting you know that we could get out of it and i think uh, maybe i can kind of move to that next question that i've prepared right because in your book you're also you know, optimistic, you know, you're not only talking about, you know, how tough it is. And obviously, we've all got used to it, and we've got the money to spend it. And, uh, but, you know, maybe we could spend it in a better way. Because what you're saying, or you're trying to hint here is that you feel that, you know, IT is really getting to a point where with the current technology, just like with drive trains and steam engines, you know, it did, um, you know, the industrial revolution was getting to a plateau, and we couldn't really move on from there. I think just the same way, you know, with the paradigms we're doing IT now, um, we might be moving to a different thing. And you compare a little bit how the steam engine, you know, was replaced by electricity and how that took a long time because it took a, a change in mind shift. You know, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that because I thought that it was very enlightening yeah. actually when I read the book. Yeah, no, I, I borrowed this from a very beautiful book by somebody named Brian Arthur, who's written a lot of other mm -hmm. interesting stuff. But this book Heard is called, yeah. called The Nature of Technology. And at one point he makes this observation, you know, the industrial revolution was going full steam ahead, if you pardon the pun. Uh, so if you had a factory, you had a steam engine out in the back and it was going like crazy and turning this big shaft that went the length of the factory and coming down from the shaft were all these belts and every, you know, sewing machine or saw or drill or whatever was powered by this belt. And somebody invents electric motors and somewhere around 1880 or so. And you think, well, it's obvious that oh, we're gonna have an electric motor for every sewing machine drill, you know, as we do now. But no, that didn't happen for 30 or 40 years. And what kept it stuck, it wasn't, it wasn't anybody's conspiracy. It was the fact that to build a factory, you needed about a dozen different skills. And each one was, was in this ecosystem. You know, the, the people who knew, how, the architects who knew how to build a building out of bricks that was strong enough to withstand a vibrating shaft, you know, those, those are the architects you needed. Well, of course, they're going to build a building that's good for shafts, not one that's good for little electric motors. And, and even the workflow designers, the, guy, the, the equivalent of, of business process automation these days, were the guys who were good at lining up, you know, things with, with shafts and making the work go from workstation to workstation. It was, it was quite an incredible thing that just kept the whole world perpetuating out. itself yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, well, and he doesn't say but i suspect 
probably more of the move was from brand new companies rather than companies that that retooled. Well, that's I think that's uh, I think that's what we see today as well, right? I mean, we, we've got the the <laughs> large animals, let's say, right? And even when we're in these large organizations, and we you know we're very successful with the innovators, but mm -hmm. they're always just a little you know. A little small group, you know, that is fighting against the big data warehousing group or a big, big Oracle lobby or SAP lobby or whatever, you know, that's trying to perpetuate what's already there. And, um, you know, so probably the majority of the audience is people who are like minded or at least, you know, uh, have been fighting the good fight, let's say, and say, okay, but there is a new paradigm here that's more uh, data centric than application centric. And I think so, you know, when you get to get the book or get to read in the book, I think it's very interesting to see that, you know, you're not alone. This has been going on forever. Question is, you know, what can we learn from that? You know, I think first thing I think that we can learn from this is that um, it's it happened before. And if we understand the pattern, maybe we can break it because we can show people, you know, that they are just like the steam engine people just holding on to their seat, basically, or not, not, not negatively, you know, they may be benevolent, you know, they want to do the best for the company, they do what they learn. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we live in a learning society. I mean, we have so much access to information, I think it's up to us, you know, to uh, document and prove that it's possible. And we're seeing more and more and more organizations seeing the electric light, basically, in this one, right, <coughs> and, and move forward. So yeah, um, that's Very interesting. I, I think like, again, if you pardon the pun, I think the light goes on for people when you, they see their own data brought together in a way that is just not possible in the in the stovepipes. Well, that's that, that's a, that's the the crazy thing, right? That we can simplify stuff in a, a, at speeds that are just inc incredible, and then you know, it's sometimes you know people are afraid you know to take risk, right? So it looks so good, it looks too good to be true. Right. Uh, so sometimes like your guy, you know, with the 500 million uh, Salesforce in integration, you know, we could go in and say, well, a Salesforce integration, you know, that's not going to cost you more than 25 million. And the right. customer is the one who is not going to give you the job because right. he said, well, I'm going to get fired for being so stupid to buy a cheap solution. Right. Um, so it's ridiculous. But yeah, yeah. well, that's, just, yeah. Uh, that's what we yeah. got. And I think it feeds nicely into your whole storytelling here. Um, because I think this is the type of storytelling that all of us need to do, you know, within the organization, because we, you know, we are in this changing phase and we need to, you know, share and be patient also with our fellow uh, colleagues, right? And, and kind of know what process they are in, you know, I mean, we are at this stage and, and um, be patient and, you know, pick them up where they are basically and show them, you know, a smooth way forward. I think that's, that's going to be interesting. And um, well, I mean, when we have this discussion with our colleagues in the organizations, you know, and we, we feel that we are in this edge, you know, to a new age, basically, I think this feeds in nicely into the, the, the you know, what has, you know, what's the quagmire and what are the best practices that really don't work, right? Or have proven to not work. I think maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that because in your book, you really nicely picked out those seven quagmires, I guess, or uh, fallacies, I yeah. guess, and yeah. elaborated on in detail. But maybe you can take one or two of those. And I think we previously yeah. highlighted already the two that you're going to talk about today. Yeah. You know, but uh, for the audience, all seven will be detailed in, in the book um, because yeah. I think it's very important to know because those are the ones, you know, that we can take in, uh, as discussion points to the rest of the organization and say, hey guys, you know, we are reinventing the wheel X, Y, Z and so forth, right? Uh, because we need to prove, you know, that we're not only different, we are, but we're actually better. Right? Yeah. So each, each one of these, as we discuss, is a cliche. And sometimes cliches are actually useful distillations of knowledge, but, but sometimes cliches are a substitute for knowledge and they actually get in the way. So for instance, this this let's not reinvent the wheel. Probably once upon a time, someone was saying, if somebody solved this problem before, let's borrow from what they've done. But nowadays, when you hear that expression, you know, somebody's talking about building some add-on to some system or something, and inevitably, the most senior person in the room will, at the appropriate moment, with a lot of, you know, fanfare, will take their glasses off and set them on the table and say, let's not reinvent the wheel here. 
You know, they have this very dramatic, and then that's just a code word. Let's go out and right. buy an incredible complex system because it sort of does what we think it wants. It has no idea that integrating that is going to cost you a hundred times more than, and you know, it wasn't even the wheel. It was a lug nut. You know, let's just go get a lug <laughs> wheel. But anyway, and then, you know, I know we're out of time. I'm just going to mention very briefly, sometimes, you know, for a long time, people were outsourcing all of their IT. That, luckily, that has reversed a fair bit in the last 10 years. But people used to be stuck because they turned everything over to a third party and change got even more expensive. It was sort of ridiculous. And they, their excuse was, well, we're not in the IT business. So let's hive that up. Everybody's in the IT business now. You can't be in business and not have to have information about it. Unless you're making everything absolutely by hand and selling it on the street, you're in the IT business. So but anyhow, I wanted to leave a minute or two for uh, questions. And I mean, I could, like you said earlier, I could go on with this stuff forever. Well, and I, I definitely love to listen to you because I think, you know, you have so much info, insightful stuff uh, to tell us about and that goes way beyond what's in the book. Um, but I can just reiterate, you know, how interesting it, is, it was to read your book. I think it uh, gave me a lot of great ideas um, to have conversations with um, with my clients, with my colleagues, with my partners, um, because it is really important for us to understand, you know, where we come from. Um, what's um, because I think we all, you know, and this is also the thing I, um, you know, it helped me a little bit because why is digital transformation even something that we need to talk about? Right? I mean, <laughs> we've been digital all the time, right? I mean, we've been giving IT money all the time, you know, I mean, uh, no CEO can be, you know, called out for not giving IT enough money, basically. Um, and still, you know, it's, It is obvious that, you know, the business side basically in companies is totally unhappy with what they get in terms of support from IT. And IT is totally unhappy because, you know, they get, you know, that uh, incrementally less every year. They're supposed to save money. And it's kind of, um, I think, and I don't know if this was you, but I think it was with you, you know, the, the way that software and IT is being produced overall, you know, goes back to, you know, building cars and I think actually you know me working for Volkswagen and Daimler and, and those car manufacturers it's always the same why can't IT produce um, software like we produce cars why is mm -hmm. that not possible well maybe right. because uh, in software you know the bumper needs to be aware that it's part of a car right and it right. needs to be connected to navigation system lidar radar whatever it works in the integrated way in software It's been like that forever. And actually we've got even more of that complexity and it, software can't be you know, managed in the same way. And particularly not because in the beginning you know, of IT, it was only a bumper that was just a bumper, right? Didn't right. even know it was part of a car, right? right? Actually software was built in a way that every part is just a part. It's not aware of the rest. Right? That's right. this closed world assumption thing. And then we get back to the application centricity of it all, right? It, software is a car cons, mm. co consistent of a bill of material that is totally unaware of the rest of the car. And so obviously it couldn't drive a single vehicle off the dealership, uh, right? Um, without an integrated package. And, and that's what we don't have with software right now. Yeah, I mean, software has kind of become the electric harness of my old MG. You know, it's just yeah. a spider web of wires and you have no, God, the fact that this works at all is a miracle. Uh, well, I'm not seeing the questions uh, for whatever reason. Well, we'll let's do it that way. Uh, work on them together with Dave, if that's okay with you, Dave, and, and uh, give some feedback to the audience. Um, and um, then, of course, you know, let me just pull the plug here for, for, for this one because we... We are expecting you in uh, for one more time, you know, because I think um, on the one hand, it's interesting. And this is what everybody does, you know, complain about what's going on now and not, not offering a proper solution, right? I think the great thing about this other book that you've wrote, written and, you know, basically halfway through the book, you're kind of desperate to jump to the next book because you do really look for answers now and you're hinting that you have those answers. I think I'm really looking forward to talking to you in January about, you know, how we could do things differently. 
right? And um, and so so let's um, provide the answers of, uh, as a follow up, and we'll also invite everyone uh, to the January call with the data centric revolution and some ideas of how we could you know get out of this quagmire. And um, yeah, so for now, I think I'm I'm just left to thanking you, Dave, for taking the time. Well, thank you. And in fact, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But I think before we started this call, you mentioned that if attendees want a copy, you were, you were going to volunteer one up. Is that? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Call me up on that. Even if you just see a recording, uh, we did get a couple of copies of the book um, because I am totally excited about it. And I think I want to share this message. Um, so if you con contact us and leave some details, uh, we'd be very happy to send you a copy. And um, we'll probably do the same for the data centric revolution in January. <laughs>